Hey, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. I want to talk about what type of hormone testing is best for you. There's a lot of different versions that are out and many companies that market various hormone tests often push one as being more accurate or more useful or you know, more important. And I want to make sense out of this because it's important to get your hormones dialed in. And to do so, you've got to have accurate tools along the way. So let's do a little bit of hormone 101 before we get going into the testing too much. So hormones, I think about them as two big categories. You know, there's the ones we make below the waist and the ones we make above the waist. And below the waist are the ones made by the testicles, the ovaries, and also the adrenal glands. And then above the waist, if we draw the line at exactly the right spot, we see the hormones made by the pancreas, by the thyroid, by the pineal gland, by the pituitary, by the hypothalamus. So below the waist, we call these the sex hormones. And they're distinct because they're modified versions of cholesterol. They're made out of cholesterol. The main ones are the estrogenic hormones, and that includes estradiol, estriol, and estrone. We also have the androgenic hormones, the main ones there being testosterone, DHEA, androstenedione. There's a few other more minor ones. We've got the main adrenal hormones, cortisol, cortisone, DHEA, pregnenolone. Now moving on up, <laughs> up into the above the waist, these are now no longer cholesterol byproducts. These are now protein chains. So they're long strings of amino acids. And these include the thyroid hormones, so T3, T4, T2, the ones that are made by the gland. There's also reverse T3, which is converted from the gland. Then we think about the pituitary hormones, uh, follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, luteinizing hormone, LH, adrenal corticotropic hormone, ACTH, thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, um, human growth hormone, HGH. There's many made by the hypothalamus. Few of those come up much for testing, so I won't detail on those. We've also got the pancreatic hormones that are regulating blood sugar primarily, so insulin and glucagon. And then we've got a few liver hormones. The main one here is one called IGF-1. And the general idea is that the hypothalamic hormones tell the pituitary hormones what to tell all the other glands. So think about the hypothalamus as like the CEO. So uh, this is the big boss of the corporation. And then the pituitary is the manager. And the glands are the various workers. So the CEO tells the manager what to tell the workers. And there's feedback throughout all these systems. Now, when I was discussing this topic a few years ago, I thought it'd be a fun illustrative idea to just prove how, how you can see such different results by different types of hormone tests. And so I'm gonna share the results that I did on myself several years ago. At the time, I was earlier 40s, uh, at, you know, no symptoms, really, really good health overall, and I was a pretty competitive athlete. So male, early 40s, there's some things you would expect in terms of just cortisol balance, um, androgenic hormones like testosterone, you know, you wouldn't expect to see a lot of estrogen show up. And by and large, you can take a look at how the salivary tests, the blood tests, and the urine tests differed. And you can see some findings that just would not make sense. And in those cases, that'll tie into just the variabilities in these tests that I'll go into. So overall, the types we've got are blood tests for starters. <clears throat> and blood tests are looking at the total and or the free fraction of a hormone. And if they're not specified, like in the case of say T3 or in the case of testosterone, if it's just said a T3 test or a testosterone test, that's looking at the total amount of the hormone. And total means how much is free and active in conjunction with how much is bound up and is inactive. And in most cases, the amount of free hormone is not unpredictable. It's pretty, pretty reasonable. But there are times to where you'll have more or less free more hormone than you would expect. And in those cases, total hormone tests can give you results that don't make sense. Someone might have, for example, a very high level of testosterone, but a large percent of it is bound up by carrier proteins. So the active free amount is quite small and they could have symptoms of low levels of testosterone, even though there's a lot there based on the total. Same thing is true for thyroid hormones. 
So that's one limitation and consideration, I should say, for blood tests. So you've got to make a distinction between total and free amounts. Now also we've got to think about timing in terms of blood tests. So blood tests show hormone level at the time the blood is drawn. And some hormones have a strong circadian cycle. So cortisol, for example, if you measure it in the morning versus the afternoon, you'll get a very different number. And you've got to distinguish between that. Thyroid hormones are also circadian. And that's often not taken into account well enough. Now, a few other, in the case of cortisol, the act of a blood draw itself can skew cortisol levels. So that can be a bit of an outlier. You know, it's getting poked by a needle. No one loves it. And some people really don't love it but it can alter cortisol levels. Another big thought, because this is an instant test, is that some hormones do vary throughout a predictable rhythm. And the big thing there is just the, the menstrual, uh, menstrual hormones, the estradiol and progesterone. You know, in the course of a woman's cycle, where you test those hormones can completely shape what kind of outcomes you get. By and large, there's a stable window for both hormones, which is showing up right about a week before the end of the cycle. So day one being the first day of the period, and let's say we're talking about an average 28 to 30 day menstrual cycle. Typically between days 17 to 23, both estradiol and progesterone are stable, and it's a good time to measure them. But you are seeing their effects after ovulation. So that's important to take into account. You can see ovulatory activity earlier in the cycle for estradiol, but not necessarily clear data on progesterone output. So oftentimes in the case of female hormones, I'll help your doctors say, you can't test them because they fluctuate. Well, you can test them. You just have to know when to test and when a test was done. Or women may have a test done and it was not timed with the menstrual cycle. And in those cases, you cannot make sense out of what those levels are. Now, blood tests, we've also got some challenge tests. So there's ones in which you can look at the pituitary response or the glandular response to receiving some kind of a challenge substance. An example would be ACTH. So ACTH is normally what your pituitary releases to help the, the adrenals make cortisol and make other hormones. So if you're wondering if someone has the inability to make more cortisol, you can actually measure their cortisol and then give them a dose of synthetic ACTH and then measure cortisol again afterwards. And if they're healthy and you give a standard dose of like 25 micrograms, their cortisol levels should double within an hour. If they do not, that's showing that the adrenal reserve is compromised. And there are some cases in which the glands make normal amounts of hormone on a day-to-day -day basis when you might check, but when they're given a challenge like that, they cannot keep up. They can't make extra when they're asked to do so. We also see this in the case of glucose and insulin. So a really helpful thing with evaluating blood sugar, yes, it's good to see it where it is just on a regular day, but it's even more meaningful to see what happens to blood sugar under the state of a challenge. So if you take a large dose of glucose and see how glucose and how insulin levels respond to that, that can be more meaningful. So blood tests also have the option of challenge testing like that. A couple of drawbacks, blood tests are not helpful for gauging cortisol slope. And that's that morning to nighttime difference between cortisol levels. So the drawback is you can't get blood tests at midnight or close to it. And even if you did, that itself would completely change how your day circadian cycle is working. You know, you go drive to this other place, you're not in your home, in your bed, and you're getting a blood test, which can change cortisol onto itself. So you can't see cortisol slope with that. There are also some hormones to where they're made in pulsatile fashions, meaning you normally don't make much, but every now and then you make a bunch. You know, growth hormone is a big example of that. So in the case of growth hormone, most of what we make, we make at just like two, three in the morning, some random time at night for a few minutes, then it's gone. So blood levels will not show it. And that's also difficult because there are some disease states in which the glands normally look fine, but every now and then are completely goofy. So we've got things like pheochromocytoma, for example, to where there's tissue that's like the adrenal glands, but it's not in the adrenal glands. And every now and then it dumps out a huge shot of stress hormones. And if you weren't doing a blood test at the lucky time, you may not see that show up. 
So blood tests, what they're really good for, all the, everything below the waist here, the sex hormones, the thyroid hormones, the adrenal hormones, um, and they're also good for the pituitary hormones. The other big category we've got are urine tests. And there's a few versions of that. There's 24-hour, there's spot, there's circadian. There's a newer thing I'll mention, which is the circadian spot urine called the Dutch test. Now, the general ideas about urine tests are that hormones do show up in the urine. And the perk is that because they take longer to get there, you can level out some ways in which they might vary from moment to moment. And that's especially useful for some of the disease states I mentioned where your hormone output could be really erratic. So if you make a big burst of cortisol from some wayward adrenal tissue, you don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen probably within a 24-hour period. And there's so much that comes out, it can skew that whole day's average. So that's where a 24-hour hormone collection can be really good. Now, spot hormone urine tests can check urine at a set point in time. And the drawback about that is you cannot really infer that time collection with the output at that time. What I mean by that is if you do a urine sample at 8 a.m., it might seem intuitive that that reflects your 8 a.m. output of that hormone. But in actuality, it does not because the time frame between releasing a hormone in your bloodstream and peeing it out in your urine can be pretty big. You know, based upon the particulars and the hormone, that gap could be anywhere from an hour to eight hours. So there is a popular test right now called the Dutch test, which tries to take the idea of a circadian test by checking many samples across the course of the day, but it does that through urine. And the drawback is urine is just so delayed in what's in circulation that you cannot have a meaningful timestamp on it. Uh, some other drawbacks about urine and limitations is that urine contains a mixture of hormones in various conjugated types of byproducts. So what I mean by that is your glands release the hormone in an active state, and when you're done with them, you bind them up with a lot of carrier proteins meant for elimination. And you also convert them in ways that are not the same as which they are in circulation. Now another wrinkle too is that leftover hormones, some you pee, some you poop. <laughs> and I don't mean so much you know, this one goes here, that one goes there. I mean, of the sum total of every, any given hormone, some is released through urine and some is released through stool. And it's not a set fraction. So you don't really know how much you made by seeing how much you pee. You can't accurately say how much you did on a day-to-day -day basis. The urine tests are only good for looking at how you dispose of hormones and how much your output is at the extremes. And they're only good if you're not concerned about the exact time of production. So the idea of looking at a urine amount of a hormone at a spot point in time, and to try to infer how much you made at that time and how the glands are functioning on a day-to-day -day basis, you can't do that very well. That's just not meaningful in terms of how they work. They are good more so for the disease states, things like Cushing's or pheochromocytoma, or carcinoid syndrome. They're not useful for normal hormones within the parameters of daily production. So things like the estrogens, the DHEA, the androgens, the progesterones, growth hormones, thyroid hormones, urine, just not helpful for that. Next up, we've got salivary, salivary hormones. And some general ideas, salivary tests, the same way in which urine was so delayed and hard to correlate with a timestamp, salivary tests are very acute. So they correlate with a very tight point in time. And the good thing about that is it's a great tool for measuring cortisol slope. So not the whole output of cortisol, but how the cortisol output varies throughout the course of the day. And to be precise, we talked before about free and total hormones, right? So saliva is looking at the free fraction of the hormone, not the total output. And another limitation is that some hormones, just by their molecular size, they get into the saliva. Other hormones are just too big to get in there in consistent fractions. Another wrinkle is that there's hormones that are in the saliva and there's also hormones that bind up with blood cells. And it's not uncommon to have a few microscopic amounts of blood cells in your saliva. If you ever brush your teeth really hard, you might spit a little bit pink, so that's visible. But it's really common to have microscopic amounts of blood. And because there can be so much more hormone attached to blood cells, those few little bits of blood cells can completely skew the levels.
So because of all that, salivary tests are not helpful for really anything besides cortisol. There are panels that measure DHEA, the estrogens, the androgens, progesterone. There's some that even measure things like growth hormone and thyroid hormones from saliva. They're just not meaningful for that by dint of the chemistry of saliva. The other drawback is that if you use them for measuring a hormone that you're taking, like say you take cortisol for a treatment or you take a estrogen cream, because saliva changes so abruptly, it's hard to make sense of how that's affecting you because you're gonna see a quick spike within the first few hours and then none much afterwards. So saliva is quite reactionary, but it's a good tool for cortisol slope. And in fact, it's the only practical tool for cortisol slope. And to date, there have been thousands of papers looking at the relevance of cortisol slope tested through saliva and have shown that it is a meaningful predictor of lifespan, disease risk, symptoms, all kinds of important things. And also that it does respond to dietary intervention, lifestyle, mind-body type therapies. So it's a real thing, but it's only good for cortisol. <laughs> Just to round out and be thorough, there are also hair hormone tests, believe it or not. The main thing here is really just for cortisol. And this was done because we know that cortisol is made by the adrenals, but also it's made by the liver and by the brain and by the visceral fat, believe it or not. And you can't measure that accurately by looking at a blood, salivary, or urinary level. So hair cortisol is done to check that whole body burden. At the time of this video, those are not commercially available, the hair cortisol tests, and they're really used mostly in research for gauging cardiovascular risk from cortisol. And honestly, you can see that same thing by cortisol slope. One more thing about salivary cortisol is that because it's the free fraction, because it is so dynamic, it's not a valid tool for evaluating adrenal diseases. So you can't look at a salivary panel and say, oh, that person's low, their adrenals cannot make cortisol. That's not what that means. That means the body does not want a higher cortisol burden. And that can mean that the brain is not stimulating the adrenals. It can mean that more cortisol is being shunted to cortisone. It can mean more cortisol is being bound up by carrier proteins. There can be a lot of things besides the adrenals being unable to make cortisol. And a pitfall I've seen is that many people will do a salivary test and see low cortisol levels across the board and think, oh, I need more cortisol. I must take cortisol. And in some cases that can help short-term symptoms, but it often will not improve health, except for the rare circumstances to where the adrenals cannot make cortisol. And you can only see that by blood tests in combination with urine tests, ideally. So when do you test your hormones? Well, time of day matters and eating things matters as well. So thyroid hormones, best thing is first thing in the morning, before eating, before taking thyroid medications. Menstruating women, if you're looking at any hormones, any reproductive hormones, about day 17 to 23 of the cycle is the best window of time. And anyone who's taking hormones, you think about testing roughly 24 hours after, 12 to 24 hours after a dose for a pill, about three to six hours after a dose for creams or trochies, the lozenges, a couple of days, two to four days after a shot, and three to five weeks after a dose of pellets. The timing is totally critical. I, I see so often someone will have, they're, they're being treated with a hormone and they're tested for that hormone, but no one really thought through when was the retest compared to the last dose. And it completely changes things. The biggest pitfall there would really be thyroid hormones. Someone might take natural thyroid, they get a blood test, they take their dose in the morning, they get a blood test a few hours later, and the T3 levels are high. And the doctor will freak out and say, oh, this is bad for you. And in reality, that was just a mistake in the timing of the test. That's a hormone where you've got to take it before the tablet. So hormone tests, <laughs> blood tests, great for most things. Salivary tests, really good for cortisol slope. Urine tests, good for checking disease states. Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. I'll be back really soon. In the meantime, take great care of yourselves.